you can open to chapter 7 of Exodus. I trust God's going to work in all our hearts and lives this morning. But however, as I prayed and I prepared for this lesson, I wasn't sure what God wanted me to zero in on. You know, there's so many things in this chapter. Maybe the two messengers, I thought, Moses and Aaron. I mean, they are two faith-filled leaders, obedient to God, God's vessels and all, and God did use them. Then I thought maybe the first plague, the River Nile turning into blood and the significance of all that and the impact that it had on so many people. Maybe zero in, I thought, on Pharaoh himself. There was a message there, definitely. Thought he was a god and maybe a message on the lack of humility or something like that. And I am going to briefly share on those few things. But then it happened for me, as it always does, after I stress about it for a while, a song. Worship songs, they come into my heart, it seems like, almost every time I'm going to speak. And this time, it was a beautiful, older worship song. And then I, put, I listened to it on YouTube. And it so refreshed my heart that I, I thought, there it is. And that song is, I will lift my hands to the coming king, to the great I am, to you I sing. For you're the one who reigns within my heart. And the chorus I love, I will serve no foreign god nor any other treasure. You are my heart's desire, spirit without measure. I feel like singing it, but I thought I'd spare you all that. <laughs> I kind of did, the way I said it. Maybe some of you know it, I don't know. If there's time, I want to play it for us at the end. Anyway, the words to that chorus have become kind of the title and the theme for this message. So remember it as we go through this study, okay? So with that short introduction, let me just say a quick prayer for us all. Lord, we bow our hearts to you, and you are God. And I pray that you would speak to us all today according to your plan and your love in our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. The other day in my devotions, I was reading from David Jeremiah's devotional, and it was entitled, Choose One Chair. And it was about Luciano Pavarotti. And you know he was a world-famous Italian opera singer. And it caught my eye because, well, first of all, when I was a child, my father, who was Italian, he loved Luciano Pavarotti. And then I had an uncle who would always sing operetta songs to us, even like at the dinner table. He would just start singing. And um, his favorite was Paiachi. I think that's what it's called. And it was about a very sad clown that has to paint a smile on his face. And, and I was remembering when Al and I were first married, the very first dinner that Al, my husband, ever had with my uncle. He just started singing Paiachi. Just, we're all eating, and he, he just would do this. And the thing was, he would cry real tears when he would sing this song, because it's about a sad clown. And it was just such a memory, because I remember my husband was sitting almost next to him. <laughs> and it was the first time he had ever met him, the first time he certainly had, had dinner with him. And you know, he was a young guy, 21, and this man singing and crying at the dinner table. And he didn't even know how to respond. And I remember it was pretty amusing to me. I was used to it, but. <laughs> Now here's why I'm even telling you that story. Not that it has anything to do with my uncle or my father or, or my husband. It's just that, that's just a nice memory for me. But here's the real reason. When Luciano Pavarotti was a boy, his father introduced him to the wonders of song. And he urged Luciano to work very hard to develop his voice. He took his father's advice, he became a professional tenor he also enrolled in a teacher's college, and on graduating, he asked his father, shall I be a teacher or a singer? 
And his father replied, if you try to sit on two chairs, you will fall between them. For life, son, you must choose one chair. And so in regards to our spiritual life, in regards to serving no foreign god in this lesson, we too, we have to make a choice. Will we serve God or serve the world? And we know that James 4.4 4 says, whosoever will be a friend of the world is an enemy to God. You cannot be faithful to both. There's no room for a split alliance, no room for a divided heart. We all must choose one chair. And if not, James 1.18, no, it's James 1.8, says a double-minded man or woman will be unstable in all of their ways. So in this Exodus story, Pharaoh, no doubt, had chosen his chair. And therefore, we com he comes to a very sad ending, right? Psalm 16, 4, sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another god. Moses and Aaron also chose their chair. They chose to serve Jehovah God, the one, the only true God, Lord of all the earth. First Chronicles 17, 20, O Lord, there is none like you, nor is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard. So ladies, this chapter, I think, is really important when it comes to the worship of God because of all that's to follow, the warnings, the hard heart of Pharaoh and all the Egyptians, the 10 horrendous plagues to come, which we know was actually God's way of judging all the false gods of Egypt. And they had a god for everything. They had a god or a goddess that they bowed down for just about everything in life under the sun. And they worshiped that as well. <laughs> which we know will only lead one, to, one into having an empty life, worse yet, a hard heart against God. Chapter 7, God reminds Moses and Aaron that Pharaoh will not listen to God's commands. And the reason being, he has a hard heart. But in contrast to that, God expects Moses and Aaron to be, have an obedient heart and a soft heart and to speak for God. So we see verses 2 through 5. It says, you shall speak all that I command you. And Aaron, your brother shall speak unto Pharaoh that he send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and wonders. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth my armies and my people with great judgment. And all the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and I bring out the children of Israel from among them. And, chapter, and verse 6, Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them. And I think we should stop there. And ladies, that's very important for us to reflect upon. Because we all know Moses certainly didn't do any high fives when God asked him to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, did he? But I doubt, however, if Moses was confused about God's will in his life. He wasn't confused. I mean, God did speak to him through a burning bush. And that is one way to know that God is speaking to you. <laughs> Moses and Aaron knew what they were to do, and then they did all that God told them to, to do. Now, to me, the best thing about this truth is not only the obedience part of the calling, which is wonderful, but they were leaving the results to God, leaving the results to God himself. And I think for some of us, that can be a turning point. Actually, probably the first lesson we should glean here this week from the watershed moments of Moses. Do what God tells us to do on our spiritual journey and then leave the results in God's hands. I mean, we more than likely will not have the burning bush experience, but I believe there are a few basic principles involved that will help us to experience God's will in our own life. 
and they're, they're not hard. It's not hard to understand. First, there must be a willingness to do God's will. I mean, are you willing? Be willing. And then I know that God leads. Secondly, you must understand God's will always will line up with his word. And in his word, we already have instructions. So we, we start by following those. And third, we must come to him seeking his will, not seeking our own plan or our own will. And that is definitely essential. And of course, that has everything to do with our daily routine in life. These three principles will always lead us in the will of God. Be willing, follow his word, and be seeking his will. And then you just make it a matter of your prayer. Lord, am I in the center of your will? I desire to be, and I desire to serve you. I know in my own life and ministry, there's been many times I have, I've wondered if I'm where God wants me to be. Am I doing what God wants me to do? Al and I, uh, we pastored a lot of many churches, really, since stepping down from retiring from Calvary Chapel, Prescott. And most of them have been far away, you know, in another state or whatever. And I've been challenged, sometimes feeling like I've been away too long. I'm missing my home. I'm missing my my children and my grandchildren. I'm missing my home church and you. And I have sought the Lord for confirmation. Am I serving you well, Lord? Am I serving you where you want me to be? Am I doing it the way you want me to do it? And fortunately, his answers have always seemed to bring me a peace. And I can rest or be still, just be content in God's answer. Because, well, like you, I want to grow, and I want to trust in the Lord. By his grace, results seem to have always been fruitful. Just realize, as God's beloved children, God does love to speak life into us. Maybe that's one reason the story of the Exodus is even in the Bible. God wants to speak life into us. Now, I have a funny story, but a few weeks ago, we bought an Echo. It's an electronical device, okay? Apparently, her name is Alexa. And we purchased it mainly to listen to Christian music in the kitchen. <laughs> the other night, Al and I were fooling around with Alexa before we went to bed. <laughs> that would have been fun. No. <laughs> we, were, we were just messing around with, um, Alexa, with this device. And I said, Alexa, good night. And we were so surprised. We didn't know she could speak back to us because we were walking away. And she said, Good night, <laughs> sweet dreams. We were shocked. Like I said, we didn't know that she would speak back to us. So then I said, Alexa, I love you. And she said, oh, how sweet. <laughs> it was weird, really. <laughs> it was like I had another woman living in the house, you know, a female robot. She, it was funny. It was creepy, actually. <laughs> but ladies, when God speaks to us, <laughs> it's nothing like that. And it should not be a surprise. It should not be a shock to us because he's a living God, completely sincere, and he's completely well-meaning when it comes to you and to me. He wants to speak his ways into our life always. It's for our good. And he uses his word, he uses people, he uses circumstances to show us our hearts many times. And that's especially true when you think about Bible stories. 
I mean, take away the people, take away the circumstances, and we would have a hard time really thinking our way through scripture, don't you think? It's people. It's people like Moses and Aaron and, and, the, and their mother, Jochebed, and there's so many others we could name that cause us to connect with scripture and learn spiritual lessons from their lives. Actually, all the people in the Bible, all the people from Bible times have simply been God's vessels. All have been confronted with many trials, just like all of us are. But it's pretty interesting that God can still use their lives to speak into our life in the present day, isn't it? I mean, we can even learn what not to do from someone like Pharaoh. In this story, Moses and Aaron, they come before Pharaoh now and they begin to do miracles, such as turning the rod into a snake. But it meant nothing to Pharaoh. Of course, by some evil power, God allowed Pharaoh's magicians to do the same. And the, scenes of, the, the scene of all that I find kind of interesting in, the, in terms of Aaron's snake getting bigger and bigger. And then, you know, you, you just picture him swallowing up all the magicians' snakes. That must have been something. Of course, it didn't change Pharaoh's heart one bit. He refused still to let God's people go. So the next thing Moses uh, did before Pharaoh was turn the water of the river Nile into blood. And this was dre a dreadful plague. They all worshiped the river Nile. Some commentaries try to explain this away scientifically. But I'm so happy just to rest upon the fact that it was a miracle. And God did turn this water into real blood. God had said, in this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. But again, it did not move Pharaoh's heart one bit, did it? He simply turned, he went into his house, rejecting, dishonoring the Lord God. And his heart grew more, more hard. The last verse Verse 25, for seven days all the people were just left to dig around the river for water to drink. He was bad. He was a bad man. Pharaoh was an evil man. And we have read in the scriptures, I know that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Other places in scripture, Pharaoh's hardened his own heart. But ladies, that shouldn't confuse us one bit. God, in his foreknowledge, he knew Pharaoh's evil heart would never change. So God used that truth. God used him. He stiffened that stubborn heart. Or we could so say God firmed up that decision that Pharaoh himself had made to dishonor God. So now Pharaoh's heart just gets harder throughout all the coming plagues. And we're not going to turn there, but they're in the chapters 8 through 12. The river Nile being the first plague, the plague of the frogs being the second, both of which I guess the magicians could mimic. However, they couldn't change the blood water back into good water, nor could they take the frogs away. Only God, of course, could do that. Then came the lice, the plague of the livestock, the boils, the like that the fiery hail, the flies, the locusts, my gosh. Even Pharaoh's magicians all began to say, this is the finger of God. Still, Pharaoh, he will not change. This story shows us just how evil, just how dead one heart can become when you do not serve the one and only God. So for all time and eternity to come, he will be the one example to us what it means to resist and what it means to reject the goodness of God. And you know Romans 2.4 declares it's the goodness of God, the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And wrapped up in the goodness of God is his mercy and his grace. And I know we all say yes and amen to that because we need always God's mercy and his grace. But Pharaoh didn't. Not Pharaoh. He chose his own destiny, and that's what we need to remember from the life of Pharaoh. He made the wrong choice. And we need to remember that because it illustrates the hardness 
of much of our world today. So therefore, at this time, the plagues, they have to continue, the plague of darkness. The Egyptians couldn't see anything. Can you imagine that? They couldn't see each other. Total blindness, it was like total blindness. Finally, the Passover, the death of all the firstborn of Egypt. Of course, all the Israelites were kept safe, it tells us in scripture, in the separate land of Goshen. But the overall point, of all those plagues was to show God to be the one true God, greater than all the deities of Egypt. No doubt, though, at this time of history, God was making himself known, Pharaoh, to Pharaoh, you are not a God. Pharaoh cannot redefine good and evil. I mean, no one can, not even if they try. And I guess that does sound a little familiar, doesn't it, of our time. God desire, we know this because scripture tells us this. God desires that all men everywhere, Pharaoh, the throne, the priest in the temple, the servant in the hut, the rich, the poor, everyone in between to repent and to be saved. Every single world leader, everyone is subject to the salvation of our God. Isaiah 45, 5, I am the Lord and there is no other there is no God beside me. So what a dark time this was in history, literally. However, you know, not the darkest. There is such a correlation between the plagues of Exodus and the tribulation of Revelation. That's another study. But in the last days, the Bible speaks of tribulation like the world has never seen. And at that time, there will be a whole world filled with men and women who will not humble themselves and repent before God. Even now, many say, who is God that I should obey him? Just like Pharaoh, self is on the throne. And ladies, if we need a definition of a hard heart, a hard heart is someone who rejects or refuses to accept God, his word, and his ways. And it's a sad state of affair whenever that happens. But God gives us all a free will. God gives us all a free choice. But unless the choice is the right choice, it becomes a tragic thing, doesn't it? Scripture proclaims, Hebrews 10.31, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And I agree. Yet, ladies, we all know people who are making that wrong choice, and they're placing themselves in this position we're talking about. And some, we know, have lost sight of the mercy and the love of Christ in their lives. So as God's vessels today, and you know we are, we are God's vessels. We pray. We pray for them because life's plagues are tough enough on anyone. Painful, really, to the core, isn't it? And we know that people need the Lord. So don't grow weary in praying for those people in your life or that are on your heart. Instead, have that soft heart to continue to care and be obedient to God in that. Because God hears our prayers, and his answer can be, a watershed moment or a turning point for someone else in your life. 1 Timothy 2, 3 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who would have all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. However, we do know God doesn't force anyone to love him or to obey him. And I was thinking in his perfect wisdom, why? would he do that? And I just add, why would anyone want to spend eternity with someone who didn't love them? I mean, would you want to marry someone and spend the rest of your life with someone who wasn't going to love you? Of course not. When God created us, he didn't make us robots. He made us in his image. 
And this means we can think and we can reason and we can make decisions. So it's a choice we're all given. And I, I suppose we, we may not always love and obey him perfectly, not until we are in heaven. But I, for one, I am so grateful that God gave me that choice some 40 years ago because it changed who I became, who my children became. And if the Lord should carry, I, I can see it will affect my great-grandchildren and their children generation after generation. And prayerfully, you have all made the same choice. To me, then, this choice becomes a beautiful thing in our life because it causes God to, to begin to invest in you and me. Why, I don't know. It's a question we really cannot answer. All we do know, ladies, for sure, is that God firms up that right decision in our life, so to speak, mainly that we will have no other gods before us, as it says in Exodus 23. Our destiny, our destiny becomes sealed. The Bible declares we can consider ourselves called, called by God. That's what it says, that our names are written now in the book of life. And Ephesians 2.10, we become his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he has ordained before the world was that we should walk in them. So, I know I have no idea what God is up to in your life or in my own life. We're not given charts to hang on the wall, you know, to keep track of our growth and what's going on. All we know is that God says we are his workmanship. And I have no doubt if we're women of the word and we're willing and we're seeking that God will use us all in his way, it'll be in his time just as he did in the life of Moses and so many others. Yes, there, there will be problems, of course, all of which will affect many people. But actually, from the story of Exodus, I think God shows us that it's all, it's all part of his purpose. It's all part of his plan. So ladies, this is just more for us to reflect upon it may be another watershed moment for some here. I don't know, because I know that we can cry out, Lord, my life's not working out. Things aren't working out very well here. Most of us have been there on one level or another. Maybe you're even there you know, today. You don't think your life is working out very well. Yet, if we can take the lesson from scripture today, we will realize that God hears our prayers, he will work, and he will answer, but ladies, the plan, God's plan, is not always only about us. The story of Exodus is certainly not only about Moses. I mean, it's mostly about God and his power and deliverance, but you know what I mean. There is a lot of people involved. The Lord is doing many things simultaneously that yes, involve you, it involves me, but he's also a big God and he's looking at a lot of people. And I think as believers, we should think about that because it's not only hopeful, it's helpful, especially when we're seeking answers in our prayers. So remember, God is faithful, he'll do many things in your life, but at the same time, there are, there are Egyptians, so to speak, family, there's friends, there's neighbors, unbelievers all around us. They're watching to see how you and I handle some of the same trials and burdens that they carry. The rain falls on the just and the unjust, all the same. And God, he has not changed. He still wants all human beings to experience his love and his power. And I truly believe he he desires others to, to see how we, those of us who have accepted Christ, how we live and how we enjoy a righteous life. How and why do we strive to have righteous 
and pure thoughts from our minds. How we can still rejoice in the Lord when we're sick or hurting. How we can have the peace of God that really we can't explain it. It passes understanding even at the saddest times of our life. Basically, how we trust in him to bring us through all the problems of our life. The bottom line, our lives affect many people. And how we respond, it really means everything. We want to be able to say to anyone who asks us, it's the power, it's the grace, it's the mercy, and it's the goodness of God. And you know what? He's available for you too. All you have to do is make the right choice and worship the one, the only true God. I wonder how different this story could have been if Pharaoh had accepted God's mercy and God's grace. I mean, how many lives would he have affected? Nevertheless, God, he has worked wonders in your life and in mine, and I encourage us all to reflect upon that often. Don't allow your thoughts to be captured by the lesser things. You know the enemy wants to distract us. He wants to throw us off focus by setting our hearts on the gods of the world. And I don't need to define those for you. You know what they are. He will constantly dangle people, things, desires in front of us, anything he can to distract us so that he can erect a false god in our hearts. That's why Proverbs 4.23 is so important. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Other translations have said all the issues of life begin in your heart. So in closing, I hope we all realize just how blessed we are today to not question as Pharaoh did, who is this God? I do not know him. I mean, that's the saddest statement in this entire story. Yet you know, people in the world continue to speak like that. And I know that's true because I have been there. That's exactly what God spoke to me one night some 40 years ago. He said, Becky, you do not know me. I thought I did. But he said, not the way that pastor is talking about. But fortunately, the solution was also given, and I invited Jesus into my heart, and he's been there ever since. And I trust everyone here can say something very similar to that, and that your prayer is much like mine, too, that Jesus will always be at home in your heart and that God the Holy Spirit will feel free to work, to exhort, to teach, to correct you, to conform you, to be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ because of the most powerful truth in this story spoken to us by God himself. I am who I am. I am the Lord your God very personal. To end, I'm going to read 1 John 5, 20, which says, For we know that the Son of God has come, and he has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And then his final words, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. So, ladies, from time to time, I encourage you to check your own heart. Is your heart where it should be this morning? Is it soft and pliable? Are you seeking God? Are you in his word? And in seeking his ways? Or has your heart become a little cold or a little hardened for whatever reason? If so, this is the moment, really, to allow God the Holy Spirit to have his way again in you. We are going to close now by 
listening to a beautiful worship song, that song I told you about, I Will Serve No Foreign God, because to me this song, it sums up this entire message that I pray is in our hearts. Prayerfully, it will do this for you too. So carefully, you know, you can close your eyes and carefully listen to the words of this song. Just make it your prayer for the next two or three minutes, okay? Let's close our eyes.